green lights up here than going through Huntington. You ever go through Huntington? There's like a green light. Well, I always hit the red ones or the hot yellows. <laughs> Used to go to Belleville every Wednesday to do our kettle corn, so we had to go through Huntington about 5 o'clock in the morning so to get up there and get set up. No traffic, so, you know, and you go to, and there's a red light, and you just sit there, count, you know, so I always tried to beat the red light or tell my wife, you can't stop this trailer on a dime. Yeah. So, uh, but I think I got them all on. I'm good, everybody? Back there, I'm good? Okay. I think we're on Facebook and what's this other gizmo up here for? A live stream? So on an in the house. Not Twitter yet, but maybe we'll get on Twitter someday. I, uh, our grandkids talk about all those platforms, you know. You know, anything platforms I ever knew growing up, you know, I always had to stand on a box to help plug into the pipeline in our dairy barn because I wasn't tall enough. So my grandpap had to build a platform for me. So when my kids, grandkids say about platforms, I tell them about my platforms. I had a platform when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, what was it? Called a wooden box, milking the cows. You know, that goes on. Then they get on to another subject real, real quick. <clears throat> How many of you enjoyed your Thanksgiving? Had family, family together? Name of our message this morning is called "Come Home," and uh, kind of goes off of the weekend that we're in. A lot of people uh, travel and go home, or come home for the holidays for Thanksgiving. And uh, I, I googled. See, I do know how to do some things, so I googled. Uh, I did mess up with my one grandson one day, and I called it goggled. I said, I goggled something. He's like, goggled? He thought I was swimming in the ocean or something. But I said, I, I, I Googled. I was curious how many people they estimate travel on the Thanksgiving weekend. said, this year there was an estimate of 109 million will travel home for Thanksgiving, which is 42% of the adults in America. That's a lot of moving around, isn't it? 109 million. We had, a, for those who don't know me, I come in this morning, I got to confess, and there's a lot of new faces in here. And many times, I'm, most of the time, I'm downstairs with, with the little ones in junior church. So, and if I am upstairs, I, in the overflow sitting, uh, in the back there so I can go downstairs quickly. And I told Andy, I feel like I'm in a different church this morning. So it's good to see different faces and so thankful for that. And uh, that we have a, we had four kids and then our kids decided to increase that tree a little bit. And so we have 14 grandkids and now we're getting into another phase of life. Uh, how many have ever been to a reveal party? Anybody ever been to a reveal party? Before yesterday, I couldn't hold my hand up. But yesterday, my, uh, our grandson and his lovely wife had a reveal party for their baby they're expecting in April. And the, the deal was you wear the color shirt you want the baby to be or what you think the baby's going to be. So there was pink shirts, and I wore a blue shirt. I was hoping for a boy. And uh, his sister, uh, both of these are our are, are daughter April's old uh, children, not the oldest ones, but his, her second daughter and then her fourth child, uh, his boy, he... They, they both got married, not to each other. We're not from Hillbilly Land, but uh, they both got married last winter. And then, uh, boy, if they see this, they'll be mad. But <laughs> they got married last winter, one in December, one in January. And now they're having babies. And the one that got married in January, she's having one this January, a little girl that she lives in New York. 
her and her husband, uh, he's a youth pastor up in New York, so they're up there. And then uh, Logan and his wife, Bailey, they married in December, and they're having a little boy. It was a boy. It is a boy. So they're having a little boy uh, in April. So I told him, my wife this morning, our family tree, we won't be around to see it, but another two generations, imagine how that will explode, you know, because we do have a fruitful bunch in our family. So, uh, But being together reminds me of a, we were all together. Actually, we used the dining hall over here for our Thanksgiving. We had it toward evening because everybody has in-laws and outlaws and everybody else to go to for lunch. So I said, we'll have an evening one. My wife looked at me. We live in a mobile home that hardly big enough for her and I. You know, if we, I get mad at her. I can't even hide. I just have to go to, up on the hill or something. But uh, anyhow, uh, she said, where are we going to have that? I said, well, let's talk to Mr. Ray. And so we got over here. And I, there was around fi uh, 40 here for family. Uh, my wife's sister and her family and then our family was here. Remind me of his story. My dad passed away, but I still have all his stories back in the back of my mind. Remind me of the story my dad always told about a gentleman went with his family on the train, and they were going flying, going down the tracks. And the gentleman across the aisle said to him, "So this is your family? You gone on a picnic?" And the guy said, "This is my family, but it's no picnic." <laughs> so. Uh, we have a we have a good family, and I'm in, I'm enjoying this stage of life. So, uh, but we do a lot of in this land in this world. We travel a lot, and as I said, 109 million was estimated in America to travel for this Thanksgiving. I was thinking of the title come home, and I was thinking about Pastor had asked me a while back, because he was planning this trip to Seattle, he and Penny, and uh, so I thought, well, that's Thanksgiving weekend. thought I was going to do something on deer hunting, but I thought, well, half the people don't, a lot of people don't deer hunt, and so we'll just jump over that, and I thought, well, Thanksgiving would be something good, and uh, then we went a few weeks ago, the, took the bus trip, uh, from church here down to Sight and Sound to see the play David. And uh, I thought I knew the life of David. I didn't know anything about David until I started to watch the very various scenes of his life. And, uh, you know, as a kid, we learned about David and Goliath and a few other things. But something that really struck me as, and we're going to get to that. At the, we're going to turn to three portions, and uh, I promised the teachers downstairs I'd be down around 11:30 or 25 to 12 at the latest. So, we're going to look at three portions briefly this morning about coming home. And when we were down to see David, uh, the the one thing that really struck a chord in my heart was this. David was getting on in years, and twice, I think, in the play, he said these words. One time, the prophet Nathan had, was talking to him, but David said, I was, building, I was busy building God's kingdom, and I left my intimacy with God. I was busy building God's kingdom and left being intimate with God. And that really struck me. And we know David's life, and we know the downfalls that David had. And so this coming home, we're going to see three aspects of that this morning, really means coming close to God. Years ago, uh, when my grandparents, who lived in the corner up in Blue Knob, passed away, I was riding somewhere with my dad, and my dad was probably my age at the time, or maybe a little younger. But I said to dad, I said, how does that make you feel to see your home place empty? And uh, 
one of my cousins now live in it, and it's been changed a lot. And he said something I'll never forget. He said that now it's just a house. He said mom and dad made it home, but now it's just a house. Sometimes in our walk with the Lord, sometimes we get so used to walking in the ways of the Lord that we kind of drift from the Lord. That line from the play struck my heart that day, and I said to our pastor, we were sitting together about that, and I said, you ever experienced that? And he said, oh, it's hard when you're always in the Word and you're preaching and you're preparing to preach and you're doing this and that. You have to take that time just to be alone with Him. So this morning, turn with me to start to Matthew chapter 11. Our second portion is going to be the portion that uh, Adam read for me this morning. But Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to start and read from verse 28 through 30 to the end of the chapter, just three verses. Now this is the come home for the sinner. There's somebody here this morning or in the sound of my voice through one of the medias, and you're not saved. This is your come home time. Jesus' words, Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In these three portions this morning, I'm going to give you four things to think about, and you can look at them as we go through them. We're going to look at four things of God, God's goodness, God's grace, God's generosity, and God's guarantee. God's goodness, God's grace, God's generosity, and God's guarantee. In Romans 2, 4, and we won't turn there, it says that the goodness of God leads men to repentance. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Generosity, uh, in, in Psalm 68, 19, it says that God loads us or loadeth us with all benefits. God's guarantee, Romans 11, says that God's gifts and callings are without repentance. He doesn't take them back. You ever, you ever heard the term or used the term growing up, Indian giver? Probably can't say that today. It's politically incorrect. But you, you, we used to say that, you know, my neighbors or my cousins or somebody, we'd be out playing and they'd give me something at the end of the day. Hey, I want my ball back. Well, you're an Indian giver. God is not an Indian giver. His gifts and calling of God is without repentance. He doesn't take it back. I want to define the word repentance for a minute on, in the first part where God's goodness leads us to repentance. One night down in Wednesday night, we started a, a preteen class. And sometimes there's two or three, and sometimes we've had as many as eight in that class. One night we were going doing a Bible study and we were talking about the word repentance. And I said, any of you want to define repentance for me? And one young lady raised her hand. She goes to a Christian school and she said, they taught us at school this. Repentance is feeling sorry for my sin and having a desire to change. I love that definition. 
Because many times repentance, we think of it, oh, I'm sorry that I've sinned. But the last part is the key part of that, having a desire to change. Years ago, on the farm, my dad, uh, mom would take in. I didn't know it. I'm learning more and more as I go through their things. Uh, 10,000 pictures and whatever. They don't have, didn't have a phone. They had Polaroids and before that. And uh, we're looking through their pictures and all that. And there's pictures of people on the farm. And who's that? Who's that? And they would take people in. Young men, sometimes it needed a place to stay. And they could come and live on the farm and help dad. And that was their, their pay was three good meals and some place to keep warm and so on. So, But one time when I was old enough to know, we had a young man there. And he would do something. And then he'd come and say, oh, Carl, I'm sorry. I heard Dad tell him one time, if you're sorry, you won't turn around and do it again tomorrow. Don't tell me you're sorry unless you're willing not to do it again tomorrow. So that's repentance. God's, And so in, in these verses here that we read, this is the invitation, the coming home for the sinner, for anybody who might not be saved. Jesus says, come on to me. And if you notice how many personal pronouns here in these verses, I have them circled. Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I, Jesus says, will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice in this verse, the goodness of God. God calls, he gives an invitation to every sinner in the world to come to him. The grace of God. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That means under the burden of sin. His grace will give salvation for anything that we've ever done or ever will do. His generosity is what? Come on to me, and I will give you rest. It's also a guarantee. Then Jesus says to take his yoke. We think of a yoke, we think of perhaps horses or oxen being yoked together. His yoke, and learn of me. And what's he say? I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You talk to some people about their soul and they say, well, I, I, can't, I can't live that lifestyle. Or I, I can't give up this or that. Here Jesus tells us that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I always try to say to someone who says that, well, you like what you're under now? What about that yoke of sin that you carry? What about that burden of of dependency upon whatever it might be that you carry without Christ. We see God's goodness in offering to the sinner salvation. We see his grace in providing his son. We see his generosity going out to find rest for our souls. We see his guarantee that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I ask a question, don't need to raise your hand. Is anybody in here that's saved would ever turn back to the yoke of sin? I think we know the answer. Turn with me to the portion Adam read, Luke chapter 15. And I had... Adam read it because it, we because of time I don't want to spend a, a lot of time on all of this but when Adam read it we got the context of this and many of us have heard over and over again about the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son years ago I was going through something in my immediate family and a brother in the Lord who's passed away now was going through a similar thing only about a year 
or two prior to one of his children, and he said to me, read the account of the prodigal son. But read it and look at it from the perspective of the father. He also told me, remember this, God loves your prodigal much more than you ever can. So I did that, and I began reading this, and every time I read this portion, I, my mind goes back to that time. I can say that in our case, and in his too, God brought our prodigals back, and they're walking with the Lord today. We know the story, the prodigal son, he wanted his portion before dad ever passed away, before ever he wanted his portion of goods. And, but it, and, and I, I don't know if I ever noticed it before, but when Adam was reading it this morning, I pulled my pen out and s circled a word in verse 12. Notice he says, and he divided unto what? Him? No, them, his living. The son in the end that we're not going to even talk about too much this morning the righteous son self-righteous son that stayed at home got just as much as the son that went away the father divided it to them and then we know the prodigal son went and he went into a far country and he wasted his money on riotous living he ended up joined himself to a citizen of the country verse 15 and he sent him into his field to feed the pigs and it says in 16 that this prodigal would have been glad to fill his belly with the husk of the swine but nobody gave him anything to eat I love verse 17 when he came to himself. I think we all, sometime in life, maybe more than once, I've had several of these coming to myself moments. For this second portion, we had first coming home for the sinner. I have it written down, coming home for the saved one, for the prodigal. I believe this is a picture not only of grace and law, as we see here, I believe it's a picture of eternal security how that son who went and lived riotous in, a, in a riotous way never ceased to be the son of the farmer, did he? Never ceased to be the son of the, the one who gave him part of his portion. But he came to himself, and in my Bible I have a note, maybe pastor said it or somebody else, before he came to himself, he was beside himself. You ever say that? My mom used to say that, and I think one of the worst lickings I ever got is when I said, well, I don't see anybody beside you, and I didn't know my dad was standing right in the other room. I, there was soon somebody beside her and me, and it was him. What happened later will be, we'll keep that confidential, but yeah, I learned never to say that, but my mom would say these two things. I'm on my last nerve, and... I'm beside myself. She needed to be beside herself a lot because she had a lot of work to do with us five boys on the farm, I'll tell you. But she needed more than one, but she always got it done. But this fellow came to himself. The way he was living, he was beside himself. He was just out of money. Some today would say down on his luck. I believe in that pig pen, in that field, God was working out his purposes in this young man's life. I want to tell you this. If you're here this morning, you're a parent, a grandparent, you're discouraged, you have loved ones, maybe kids or grandkids that are away from the Lord in the field of swine, as it were, remember, God loves your prodigal more than you can. And in his time and in his way, he will bring that one to himself. 
And notice then the prodigal, he not only beside himself, but he's talking to himself. You ever talk to yourself? I do it all the time. I'm, I'm my best hunting partner, you know. I go get in a blind. Nobody's there. I just talk to myself. My son says, Dad, you know the deer can still see you and I can hear you. <laughs> That's her first cross away. And I say to him, well, you know, I really don't want to get a deer. I'm just doing this for you. But we sometimes talk to ourselves, don't we? Here it's in a good way. He said, I, verse 18, I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I love how he puts that in order. Against heaven was first. True repentance will always bring us to the foot of the, the Father in heaven first. And then what I really like about this, verse 18, he says, I will arise. And verse 20, he says, and he arose. Many people will talk to themselves, come to the end of themselves, as it were, and say all that, but they never get up and arise and walk. Many people will say, I, I'm, I'm just like that young man on the farm, I'm sorry for what I did, and then the next day the, turns around and does the same thing again. Here the young man says, and he arose and goes. Now I promise I wanted to look at it from the father's standpoint. And he, he had rehearsed everything he was going to say to his father. Have you ever done that? You got in the, you're in a tight spot, and you think, I, I got to talk to my dad, mom, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whoever it might be, a friend. And I don't know how they're going to take it. And you stand, and you talk to yourself in the mirror, and you say, well, I think I'll say this. I always do that, and then I get to that situation, I forget everything I rehearsed. He did that. Now let's look from the Father perspective with our eyes on God saying, come home. Maybe you're here this morning, and that, like the play stuck, struck me, maybe you're here this morning and you say, Joe, I'm, I'm just not as close to the, the Lord as I once was. Well, let's see how this father responds, which represents our Heavenly Father. Very few words in the Bible are any more exciting than the first word in verse 22. Because the son comes home. And, and the father... The word buts there. But turns the whole situation around. Before we get there, though, notice what the father does at the end of verse 20. He rose and he came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. How do you think he knew the son was coming? I believe every day, many times that day, he looked down that road. Some time ago, I showed a short video to one of the classes downstairs about this portion. I loved how it was. There was a knoll on the hill, and pretty soon you could just see a little bit of a bump on the knoll of the hill, and pretty got longer. It was the sun coming, not S-U-N-S-O-N. The father seen the sun coming because he was watching for him to return, to come home. If you're away from God this morning, you're a Christian, but you just got away from God. He's waiting. He's looking. He's looking in that road for that turnaround, that repentance, and start come home. The father didn't stand there like maybe we would with our hands on our hips and saying, tapping the 
pickup truck bed or whatever he was standing. They didn't have trucks back then, but anyhow, just standing there waiting. No, what did he do? He ran. He ran toward his son. Saw him, had compassion, ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. This is a little story comes to my mind when I was, we lived in Bedford, I'd take the kids to, my kids to school. When they were little, boy, they loved to get kissed, you know. They'd get out of the car, they'd give me a kiss and hug and run off and point, point to their little friends. There's my dad over there, he's in the car over there. Then they got a little older and it was like, yeah, see you dad, nice to know you. Then they got high school, it like dropped me off two blocks from the school. And that's a true story. The, be, the dad pardoned me, and anybody that knows me, I like to be humorous once in a while, to the nauseam of my family sometime, but uh, I'd drop them off two blocks away and then drive right by and beep the horn at them. <laughs> then I had to request, please don't drive by when I'm walking with my friends. But this young man, the father didn't say, now, where did the young man come from? The pig pen. Probably didn't smell very good. Certainly probably didn't look very good. Did that matter to the father? No. I think of the song that often closed the Billy Graham crusades, just as I am without one plea. I remember watching that and seeing many come up the aisle to be saved. To that song. This is a perfect example of that. You might say this morning, well, this week I'm going to start reading my Bible more and praying more. God doesn't need us to clean up to come back. He just wants us to come home. And the father, the son starts to rehearse that little speech. And then verse 22, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive. Again, he was lost and is found. But again, to be merry. God has the very best for us at home. <clears throat> I, I reminisce in my mind this morning. I remember going to my grandparents' place as a kid on the, uh, for holidays and going in the door and smelling the cook stove and pies being baked and the goodies that grandma was prepared. And I think of what that sight must have been and we know what it was because the son, the other son responds in a way that he wouldn't even come to the party. And this speaks to me also as a believer in Christ. That no matter where you're walking with our Lord, don't ever look down on that one who might be straying farther away. Reach out. Help. I found in the past sometimes just being alongside of someone who's struggling is all that they need. And they brought the best, and he, he made merry with his son that was lost, found, began to be merry. Now let me make it clear, when we're saved, we never get lost again. But sometimes in our, you know, from our perspective, we're lost. Have you ever got in a situation and you look back and you think, how did I get here? A lot of times when I retrace tracks of my own, it started with just one little step. But to us who are saved, the Father says this, this morning, come home. He wants to have fellowship with us. He wants to fall on our neck and kiss us and 
clean it up, clean us up, as it were, from our walk. The last one might surprise you, and this is the one that came to me when I was sitting down at watching the David play. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, and we close with this portion this morning. Now remember the, <clears throat> excuse me, remember the four points that we talked about. We've seen them in this last portion, God's goodness. We see it in the beginning when he divided the, everything that he had to the two sons. God's grace as he waited and watched for the son to come back. God's generosity. <laughs> he poured out the very best for his son. And God's guarantee the father said, my son that was dead is now alive, that Nick Mary. In Revelation chapter 2, and we've been through this, the pastor went through this verse by verse, and, uh, but there's the church at Ephesus, and this portion's always struck me. Verse 1 through 5, I'll read. On to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou ha canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, hast not painted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come in unto thee, and will remove thy candlestick out of thy, his place, except thou repent. He's writing to this church, and if we stopped before verse 4, before the nevertheless in verse 4, we'd say that's a perfect church. Verse 2, he, he commends them. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, how thou canst bear them which are evil. Hast thou tried the apostles and found them that they're not? Hast found them as being liars? And verse 3, and bor hast borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not painted. <clears throat> you would say that's a perfect church, perfect servant. <clears throat> this I labeled, come home for the servant. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, I, I serve in the church. I do everything that I can. And this is a portion that struck me as I watched David that day. But how close am I to the Lord in all of this? We can labor. We can be busy. We can teach junior church. And I can say, I, I can even fill in for the pastor once in a while, and I can be away f from the Lord in my heart. Here, the Lord is calling them back to him. I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. <clears throat> Don't need to raise your hand, but can you remember when you were first saved? I was six years old. <clears throat> First thing I did, I wrote to all my four brothers a little note, you know. I guess I learned uh, early in first grade, or that was right, actually it was right before I went to first grade. You know how you wrote little notes to cute little girls in first grade? Do you like me, yes or no? I wrote to my brothers, are you saved? And I put yes or no. 
And I gave them all to my four older brothers. But my first concern for my brothers was that they were saved too. I found out they were saved. And I remember wanting to tell everybody, I was in first grade. You couldn't do this today in first grade, but some of you may know Bethel Har. She was from lovely area. She was my first grade teacher. Very godly woman. And I got a, some gospel tracts from the <clears throat> little church there in Queen that we went to. And I took him and I said to Miss Har, I got saved. Can I hand these out? And she said, Absolutely. And so I handed out these tracks. And one little boy wrote in his track, he drew a picture in it. She, he got in trouble. She said, that's God's word. You don't write on God's word. But I say that to say this. That was my first love. When I first come to know the Lord, and it's, if we're not careful, we can serve the Lord and we can do all kinds of things that are good and we can get away from really being intimate with the Lord. And he says this, Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast art fallen. In other words, recall to yourself what it was like when you were first saved or when you were walking close to the Lord. Have you ever been in those stages of life where you just don't ever want to leave it? You're walking with the Lord, and it's just wonderful. And you think, boy, I'd never want to leave this spot. I remember being on the farm before I uh, left the farm to go into the printing ministry. Uh, that I'm talking 40 plus years ago. And my favorite spot with the Lord was after the morning milking and uh, we'd feed the cows. We had a feed bin up above the, in the second layer of the barn and where we could run the feed down into the cart and feed the cows. And up there was a the compressors and all that to cool the milk in there. It was always nice and warm up there. And after I fed the cows, after milking, we fed, I'd feed the cows, and I was waiting for them to get done eating so I could leave them out for the day in the pasture. That was my spot. And you can tell by me describing it, it was a spot that I thought I'd never want to leave. I'd have my little New Testament, and I'd go up there and pull it out. And I'd read pray for the day, think about things that I needed to do and things I needed to make right. I can still hear in my mind the chains of the cows rattling and as they ate. When the chains quit rattling, I knew they were done eating, it's time to put them out. But I say that to say this, that was the spot that I remember to this day that I thought I'd never want to leave. I don't know what your spot may be. But if it's not where it used to be, come home. God calls us here. And you may be busy serving in the church, and that's what struck me with David that day. <clears throat> he said, I've been out, and it, <clears throat> it showed David coming in <clears throat> from battles and bringing the crown back, conquering peoples and lands. He said, I've been busy building the kingdom, and I've left the intimacy with God. Yes, we all can do that. Don't know where you're at today. If you're a sinner not saved, you need to come home. If you're that one who is just away from the Lord and living maybe not like this man in the pig pen, but just away from the Lord, he says, come home. Or maybe you're busy serving in the church or doing good for your neighbors or whatever, and yet you're not where you once was. The Lord asks us to come home. As I close in prayer this morning, you know where you're at. I know where I'm at. I can say before you and before God that I'm not once, I'm not today where I once was, but I want to be. 
And so as I close in prayer, you do business with God. It's between you and him, not me. But I can assure you, he is watching over that hill for that repentance and coming home. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We've just touched the surface of these three portions this morning. But, oh, Father, we bow in your presence. We're thankful and blessed for your goodness, your grace, your generosity, and your guarantees. Father, you know the heart of each one who has heard this message this morning. You know my heart, Father, and my prayer is to draw us, each one, closer to you. If there be one here or in the sound of my voice who has never come to your Son as their Savior, oh, this morning may they see you inviting them to come. Come just as they are, without one plea, but that the blood of Jesus was shed for them. So, Father, we ask that you would bless us as we go from this place. Those of us who are yours, may we walk close to you and spread the word to others who are in need of your son. Be with our loved ones in every place. Be with our pastor and Penny. Keep them safe. Guide us through the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Joe. We'll take our hymnals, turn number 229. Tell me the old, old story.